All right, we are live. Hello, gross designers. Welcome to the live show and uh, happy March. So this is a place where we will learn and discuss all things related to growth and product design in partnership with grossdesigners.co. In this episode, we have invited a very exciting special guest, Scott Christensen. He is very passionate and had a lot of experience working with startups. And he will also share insights and experience from his personal career journey uh, today with us. So if you are someone who is curious about startup life, stay tuned. Hi, Scott. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you're here. Hey, Ran. How's it going? It's great to be here. That's awesome. So, Scott, why don't you um, start by um, give us a little bit uh, an intro about yourself? Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the intro already. Um, <laughs> I'll just add to that. Yeah, I'm so I'm Scott. It's good to meet you all. Uh, yes, have plenty of experience with startups. Um, I'll kind of run through maybe my background here, but I'm a Seattle based uh, product designer focusing, of course, on uh, and growth. Uh, I have about 10 years experience specializing in growth um, at startups as well as larger enterprise companies and also team management as well as advising and coaching. Um, most recently, I was the head of design at H1, which was a hyper growth B2B Series C healthcare startup. I was there for just over two years. Uh, I was very, very much in a player coach model. I scaled the design team and the headcount and processes there. I was the first designer joining at their Series A and then grew the team to six up to the uh, Series C. Um, anyways, and then before that, I was at uh, another startup called Mystery, which was an entertainment managed marketplace based here in Seattle. Um, that was a seed stage startup. Uh, very speculative. We'll talk a little bit more about that down the line uh, later in the broadcast. But uh, uh, prior to that, I, I was actually at larger companies. Um, uh, and at that time is when I cr helped to actually create the Growth Designers Slack group. So Lex Roman and I helped migrate uh, the Facebook group way back in the day over to Slack. Um, so uh, yeah, that was uh, about the same time uh, that I was at uh, Expedia, working as a uh, growth designer there, uh, very much honing my craft as a senior designer. And then before that, got my start at a company called PwC. It's a global company. And uh, I was on their innovation digital team where I was working on zero to one products, as well as consulting for larger enterprise companies like Microsoft and Fidelity and other Fortune 100 companies. So it's a little bit about my work history. Um, but yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so it's interesting to see that you went from like very large organization like the PwC and working at some Fortune 100 companies and Expedia to seed start uh, seed stage startups. <laughs> so what what is your story there? So what makes you decide to take the leap into the startup? Yeah, world? yeah, it's a good question. Um, I definitely have gotten that a couple times because it's not the typical path. Um, a lot of people will start their careers maybe in smaller startups and then work their way up into large enterprise companies. Um, whereas I definitely started at larger and then jumped, of course, to uh, smaller startups. Uh, you know, long story short, simply put, I was uh, I was pretty bored <laughs> at the larger stage companies, and they were moving. Um, at least at Expedia, we were moving um, pretty slow. I, you know. Every every large company is going to move differently, and so I can't speak to as as like that's generally how all big companies move. But um, it was it was definitely a slower pace than what I was wanting. I'm very like entrepreneurial in nature. Um, in fact, uh, I studied business. I didn't. I'm not like a classically trained designer. I think a lot of us in growth maybe come from that type of a background or or have kind of a business or entrepreneurial bent to us. Um, because we do focus on both user needs, of course, as well as our business metrics and making sure that we make impact there. So as someone who focused, um, you know, who, who understood both sides of uh, kind of the coin there with both business and user needs, I just felt like I was going too slow. Uh, and so I wanted to get into something small and, and move fast and have huge ownership, right? 
And that's one thing we'll talk about later in this broadcast is that um, at startups, you get so much ownership and uh, you're able to be very independent and autonomous. Um, and I didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily feeling that um, while on a um, very isolated team within Expedia. Yeah, very cool. Like I, I certainly personally have experienced team with very different sizes. Um, part of it is I, I was also experimenting with myself, like which team, uh, what type of culture that I would thrive, uh, because there's lots of trade-offs for like early stage and the mid stage and large, large teams. So I certainly wish I talked to you sooner. <laughs> I, I wish we connected a little bit sooner. So I might, uh, I might do less, uh, personal experience. So again, like I'm very excited for the conversation today. Yeah. So, um, well, why don't we just jump right into it? Scott, I know you have uh, wrote this fantastic article like uh, for March newsletter uh, for the gross designers community. And I clicked right in and I sent it to my friend, Victoria. I was like, look at this, oh, cool. Victoria. But anyways, um, we're just very excited to learn and in the newsletter, you shared a lot about the pros and cons of each uh, startups of each a uh, stage and also industry. So why don't you just um, unpack that for us a little bit um, in case someone who might not have uh, read your newsletter yet? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy writing and this has been an awesome opportunity to be able to publish on growthdesigners.co. Uh, and hopefully if you, uh, if you haven't read it, um, feel free to take a look on the website, but we'll also walk through just kind of the framework that I put together today on both what's the difference between startups and larger companies when a, as a growth designer. And then also um, one thing to take into consideration too, is just kind of like, if you are going to jump to a startup, what type of startup, right? There's, you know, we, we hear these terms like seed stage, series A, series C, series D, like what does it all mean? What are the nuances? As one who's been in seed stages all the way up, um, series A, series B, series C, and into public companies, like I've seen quite a, uh, quite a breadth and uh, I, I can just unpack some of that. So let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and present my screen here and uh, we'll walk through, um, a PDF that was attached to that newsletter article um, that was uh, part of the newsletter. So, all right, you guys can see this, right? Great. Yep. So, so on the far left, just some key questions. Uh, this is a decision framework to, to think about when just considering your next startup or just your next growth job in general. And I think just a caveat before we dive into some of these bullet points, um, at the, at the beginning of any job search, it's good to just take inventory on what you really want, right? And and what matters to you. Uh, and you may not know, but some of these questions are gonna help you kind of get there. So I'll, I'll scroll down and we can kind of oh, walk through these. So the first is, you know, what kind of impact do I want? Um, you're gonna have huge impact either way you go because growth is impact at the end of the day. Like we, we make impact on the top line uh, of revenue and, and you know, at a startup, you can have huge scope and test really large. Uh, at a bigger company, you're going to have a huge user base. You're going to affect millions. Uh, you know, if you're at the metas uh, of the world, you may have billions of people uh, interacting with some of your tests. Um, so that's that's one thing to consider is like, where, where do you find a lot of value when it comes to your impact? Um, secondly is ownership. And I alluded to this earlier on my, when you asked about you know, why I made the switch. I, I really wanted to own more. Um, I wanted to work across work streams. I think it was early enough in my career where I was still okay blending with product design. Um, I was still um, okay to kind of work on like that, just like that pure value creation with feature sets versus like just testing. Um, and that's what you're gonna get at a startup. You're gonna be able to kind of blend the gap between both a normal product designer as well as a growth designer. Whereas if you go to a bigger company as a growth designer, you're going to work 
solely and purely on growth, which as growth designers, if that's what you want, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like we, we own our specialization and, and uh, you know, big companies probably make a lot of sense there too. Um, and then the next question is around velocity. So thinking about, you know, how fast do you want to test um, at bigger companies? And again, I can't speak for every single one, um, but, you know, you're going to be um, testing pretty much everything that goes out the door. Uh, you're going to be testing and targeting cohorts, uh, certain geos around the world. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance that goes into the testing strategy. In a startup, you're going to have a little bit more of a uh, fast and furious mentality where you're going to test only the most pivotal things um, because you don't have the resources to to really dive in and, and do all and, and test literally everything. Um, and, you know, it, I think that's for some who are, are very like meticulous, that might be frustrating. Um, for others who are at a bigger company and you're testing every single thing, that can also be frustrating uh, because you get to, you know, it might be slow to get to significance. Um, you know, you might be testing things for months. Uh, you know, when I was at Expedia, we tested something in it. Uh, in the help center and it tested, I mean, we, we ran it for like four months, uh, five months wow. before it got to significance. It's because there wasn't that much traffic to it, you know? Wow. Yeah. So I'll, I'll pause there. I, yeah, you know, I'll go through the rest of these, but Ryan, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add because you've been at some larger companies as well. Um, what, what's kind of your thoughts so far? Yeah, I think, it's, it's largely right, but then I think there's also another layer of the company culture. I've definitely been at like large companies that, as you said, every single thing that needs to be like uh, tested in excruciatingly small small scope is like they 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 really um, take the one variant and A B test seriously. I think a lot of times when you touch money. Like for example, if you mm -hmm. you work in the e-commerce sector and everything is directly related to money, so um, usually I, I find personally the culture is a little bit more on the conservative side. So you get a lot of small tests. Um, for example, help center. This is the first time I heard people actually test in help center. Usually, uh, in my yeah. experience, you just ship something. Um, and also there's like other like companies, like large companies, but then they're just really um, open to um, bet on things that they feel convicted, uh, are strongly convicted about. So they will just YOLO <laughs> and ship yeah. it anyways. So no test. It, it really depends on, uh, I think, from organization to organization. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think there's some key questions that you need to ask when joining any company, whether it's a small or large uh, company. And, you know, there is a, a great article from Andrew Chen, who's like the godfather of growth. Uh, if you Google anything about growth from a product standpoint, Andrew Chen's going to be at the top of that, right? Um, but he talks about a couple of questions that you need to ask uh, when joining any company. And the first is just, you kind of alluded to this, but um, is the company culture, like, do they get growth? Uh, and, you know, in quotation, do they get it? Are they willing to really commit to it and allow, yeah, these like, you know, hippo decisions to just go forward without being tested, like you were alluding to? Um, like, is the, are the senior VPs or whatever, you know, VP of, product um, or, or of growth, are they really bought in? And do they understand that no matter if it's like the CEO wanting it, it still needs to get tested, right? So like, what type of questions could you ask to uh, tease out these nuances? Yeah, it's a good question. I think one thing that you can ask is just pressure testing about, um, you know, testing um, just like the small, smallest things. Um, Andrew Chan actually says um, one thing that you can do is ask about the homepage. So 
is there like are you willing to test even just like a one percent change on the home page because a lot home page i mean anybody who's touched the home page before knows that everybody everybody has a stake in the home page uh, across the team it touches so many different teams and the willingness to change and test on that just marketing landing page is a good indicator as to you know how how much bureaucracy there's going to be and so just asking like hey when was the last time you tested on the on the marketing landing page and have you run any ab tests like how big were they um tell me about you know the changes that you made from it like i just love to know because i think and i think a lot of people can can get behind that because the marketing landing page should should be a, a very viable testing ground right it, it a lot of people um i think can get very dogmatic if it hasn't changed for years. Um, but if you have a company culture that's changing and iterating and, and um, tweaking that often, um, you can kind of probe into that um, in your in your interviews. And you might even be able to, to instigate it if you've seen changes, right? Like, oh, I noticed, you know, you guys are doing this. Is this a recent test? Like you can you can ask questions that way to I think kind of pull tease out and and uh, probe into the testing culture. That is actually really interesting. It can make, make me think. So if you, you do less marketing or you're talking to slightly larger organizations, I think there's usually like a pretty big split between like marketing uh, brand and then the product team. So I think just piggyback on Scott's example, you can probably still ask for when was the last time you tested a home? like your product home or maybe yeah. the sign up questionnaire. So I think that's usually a clear sign, uh, like how easy it is to change the home or the sign up, because yeah. like that's where you have all of these stakeholders, like every single team would totally. want to be on home, would be like, uh, would rely on the, the questionnaire. So those are definitely the more controversial areas for product designers. For sure. That brand to product handoff is, is everything. I feel like when you go from that landing page into app dot whatever, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you hit the onboarding flow into the product, just a super, you know, fertile ground for testing and making sure that that onboarding flow is just crisp. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like you're saying right there, that first touch um, to make sure that those users are, are getting value and, and understanding, um, you know, why that why this product is going to meet their needs and, and being able to iterate there is is huge. Yeah, definitely. Sorry for the distraction, and uh, you're only oh, no. halfway halfway through your uh, PDF framework. So. Oh no, don't worry about it. I think this is great. <laughs> this is meant to be a conversation, right? So we're good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of cruise through some of the, the rest of these, but uh, we've already kind of touched on a lot of this, but the scope size of tests, um, you know, you're going to have big scope. Um, you're going to be able to, it's not uncommon to rethink an entire onboarding flow at a startup versus like a narrow, maybe one or two aspects or screens of an onboarding flow, more precise scientific experience experiments at a larger company. Also, Something to think about is the team size. Um, and this is just general for any startup that you're at. You're going to have smaller teams. Uh, you're going to have fewer resources. You are going to share those resources, whether they be people or tools, right? Like data analysts, researchers. Um, you may be hard pressed to have those folks on your team. Uh, you may need to be asked uh to lean into your own user research right you may need to get into the data and get your hands dirty i mean you should be doing that no matter what but at a startup you may have to even write sql queries sometimes and this is just a, a quick aside when i was at mystery which is a seed stage startup i was having a hard time understanding uh some data in in our onboarding flow uh, or I was having a hard time uh, obtaining the data rather. And so, you know, I worked with another couple folks on the team um, 
I took a few online SQL classes. I don't claim to be an expert, but I was able to retrieve some of the information that unblocked me. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to need to have that kind of, uh, you know, generalist grit to get through and find the data that you need. If you're maybe at a super small team, like I was at mystery where, you know, it was like under 20 seed stage company. Right. Um, whereas at a bigger team, you'll never ever be expected to write SQL queries. That's, that's not even part of, um, that's not part of the gig. So, and I would say that's rare, even at, even at seed stage startups, you can always really rely on an engineer typically, but in this one case, I didn't, I wasn't able to, so I, I did it myself. Huge respect. I have never, ever written a real life. I, I don't think I've written sequel. much since then. I, I, I'm not okay. claiming that I don't put it on my resume. I don't. <laughs> you know, I, awesome. But, awesome. But yeah, I, I think along with that, this, that also kind of blends into another principle that maybe we, we could talk about briefly, but um, I know one of the Slido questions was around um, what should you look for at early stage startups that will make you successful as a growth designer down the line uh, to something like uh, something like that? I, maybe you can correct me on exactly what that question was, Ryan. Uh, yes, it, it is. Are there steps a startup should take during early stages, seed, series A, that can help them be better positioned for growth design best practice later on? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. You, you said it much better than uh, I read. <laughs> yeah. <Yay. laughs> um, yeah. And, and so this kind of blends into that. I think some of the best practices that a startup can have, and, and this is what you can kind of probe into while you're, while you're interviewing and talking to, to startups, if you're going to join one is, you know, how well instrumented are they? Do they have, um, you know, are they capturing analytics at the basic? Like, are there, is there self-service? Um, meaning like, are you able to pull your own uh, dashboards? Are you able to jump in as an individual contributor on the team to be able to find the data that you need, right? Like we were set up at Mystery in such a way that I was able to hop into Metabase, which is, a, uh, you know, I could write a SQL query there and pull the data that I needed I was, I've been in another startup, H1, where we didn't have any self-serve instrumentation or dashboards that uh, outside of Mixpanel, I could, but, but even Mixpanel, like, um, you know, it can be limited there too. But, um, but yeah, there's, so, so I would say that's um, something to poke into is just how much uh, has been set up on the, on the data side uh, mm -hmm. as for self-service, right? because that's going to be a good foundation for you to be able to really, um, yeah, hone your craft. Because as growth designers, we we live and die by data, right? We love it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I would also say you should look at their instrumentation documentation. So if you are in early stage startup or you are a founder, uh, if you're watching this, please document your instrumentation. I have so many times uh, now that I work on uh, larger uh teams and there's so many times I log into Amplitude, um, a tool that I'm very familiar with personally and login is easy. You just SSO and then I log right back out because I do not understand what are the hundreds of projects. Yeah. I don't even know which project I should be in. So not to mention doing any sort of meaningful data analytics. Um, so documentation and instrumentation is definitely super important. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'll maybe just run through a couple more here on this PDF. Um, so outside of the team and the team structure, another question to ask is how do, how do I want to run my tests? Uh, and you alluded to this earlier, Ren, like um, at a bigger company, it might be more much more conservative and you might need to be able to like have to reach stringent confidence levels uh, to release, which is always a good thing. I think if you're going to be testing, you might as well go full, full bore and, and have like confidence intervals that you're, you're matching or that you're meeting. Um, however, if you're at a smaller company, again, you're going to test only a few things that are most pivotal and there may be some 
liberal confidence intervals, there may be some more unfortunate bias that comes into play, but um, you can push against that and you can work against that. That's something that uh, I think you'll find in any organization, but uh, if there's more leeway and squishiness, you may find uh, bias coming into play. Mm. Yeah, that's super interesting. I want to dive into that a little bit. So you mentioned like there's like the two types, right? Like for like if you're more strict in terms of testing um, for A-B test. Um, and then there's the other side where like in startup, you, it's more squishy. So you, you do bigger things. And if, if you're really an early stage startup, you might not even have that much user or if you work on new features. Mm -hmm. So I kind of um, want to ask, like, so for example, if you, you are very determined that um, you're interested in becoming a growth designer, and then you happen to be working at an early stage startup where um, you do a lot of these new feature work and uh, squishy tests, I might not have like those test book experimentation exper uh, experience in my portfolio. So how can I um, like make my experience seem more growthy uh, for lack of better words <laughs> to my future yeah. employers? That's a great question. Um, to, you know, if you are set on being a growth designer, I think you can implement, there's universal principles that you can implement at whatever company you're at. And at the end of the day, it does come down to the impact that you have, right? Are you affecting the top line are you affecting, uh, you know, monthly active users, whatever the, the key metrics that you're trying to, to impact. Um, and so I would say just really dial in on those metrics and make sure that those shine in your case studies. If you aren't able to get those metrics, do what you can to get proxy metrics. Um, I, I would I would be shocked if there is not a startup out there that's capturing some of these metrics. They need to report this stuff out to their investors and their board. Right. Even if they're at a small seed stage startup, like when I was at uh, the seed stage startup that I was at, we were we had custom dashboards that we were um, that we had created and that our investors had access to uh, at any point in time. Like we would just give them a live dashboard for them to see where our metrics were at um, when it came to monthly active users. So I would say, you know, whatever you can do, uh, try to get as much data as you can. Uh, that's going to be, even if it is a little bit squishy, and you can speak to that, people understand that um, in interviews, it's not going to be this like super crisp, uh, you know, perfect case study, uh, but any metrics are going to be uh, better than no metrics. So uh, I, I would just say start there uh, when you're at a startup for sure. Yeah, what about the... Um... Opposite the reverse situation where you are at a bigger company doing like small tests here and there. So all of the scope are fairly small, but you have like large impact based on um, like because of the uh, scale of your company. Um, so how do you transition to a early stage if you decide to go early and um, like for broader mm. projects like a new feature or like this whole big thing. How can you use your uh, growth design competency to bring a unique layer of value? So this is highly related to one of the Slido questions as well. Yeah, um, I think when it comes to making the switch from big to small, you need to, well, first thing I would just say is Startups are much more apt to do a try before you buy. Um, and both startups that I've joined, I did a consultant kind of contract role uh, just to try before you buy for about three to six weeks before I actually jumped in. And the good thing about that is you get to see how people work. You get to peel back and go in eyes wide open as to what this organization is like. Um, I'd say once you start to hit like a series B and above, even I, I contracted a, um, you know, I just came in as like a consultant contractor at a series A company. But I think once you start to hit series B, series C, you're going to start to have a little bit more structured processes when it comes to the recruiting process. 
and mm -hmm. it's going to have a little less uh, flexibility there. But the earlier stage you go, the more apt the company is going to be to just kind of let you come in as a 1099 contractor, uh, do some work for them. You get paid. You could even do it on the side. Like this is nothing that has, you could do it in your moonlight nights and weekends if you can pull that off um, and really make this like easy transition versus like just taking a leap because it is a giant risk jumping to a startup without knowing what's going on there. Um, you could do, uh, well, yeah, it, you, you just want to know where you're headed and who you're going to be working with. I'll just, I'll just say that much. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you're in a, according to Elena Ver, Verna uh, from Reforge is like, you're at a, um, like information deficit because they know everything about you uh, when you're interviewing for a company, mm. but you know very little about the company and your interface is also like, uh, sorry, your information, like who you interface with during your process, I'll have this bias of saying good things about the company. So yeah. you, you, you should question about like the validity of some of the things people say as well. Completely. Yeah, you are very much at an information deficit in any company that you join, unless you know, like, unless you've already worked there, unless you know and have like very candid friend, like relationships and have, and you can have very candid relationships and see all the cracks and, you know, broken processes and things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's a funny meme that Elena actually just put out where it's like Homer Simpson's like going up to heaven. He's like, anytime you start a new job, he's like taking an escalator to heaven. And then it like halfway up, like cracks and breaks. And then it actually goes down to hell. It's like, actually what it is like, like, you know, a month after joining any company, you're, you realize just how bad things really are. Yep. Definitely been there. Not going to name any names, multiple <laughs> names um anyway so scott if i decided to join a startup and what happens to me if the startup fails and will that affect my career and is there ways like we can lower the risk mm -hmm. um, great question that's one of the slido questions i saw that somebody had asked yeah it's largely speaking no if a startup fails people understand that it's it's outside of your control. It's not all on you. <laughs> it, it is it, precisely all on you. As a designer. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah. And even, even as a CEO, like even if you do start your own company and it does fail, like people, at least within, you know, tech understand that failure is part of the process. Um, yeah. As growth designers, we learn when we fail. Uh, we, we speak about this all the time. Failure is not necessarily a bad thing at all. It is something that is a learning point. Um, I was at a company that went through COVID that got rocked. Um, uh, this mystery C state startup. Um, I lost my job and so did others. And it was just like, you know, I, I tell this story now and like no one blinks an eye. It's really not a big deal because, you know, whether it be an extra, like uh, a super crazy event like COVID was, um, at the end of the day, you, you just need to consider one thing. And I think whenever you join a company, it affects your personal brand, okay? So whenever you are thinking about joining a company, you realize this is something that you need to talk through for your next job if you're going to go to another one, right? Like um, it defines, it kind of gives you a, um, a mark on your personal brand, right? And uh, at the end of the day though, you need to you need to think. Hey, is joining a startup going to be exciting for me? Uh, am I going to learn a ton here? And if you're excited about that, if you love this product, and if you're bought in on it, follow your gut and go for it. Uh, no one's going to no one's going to ding you down the line for joining a startup that you absolutely loved working for and you were passionate about. You did great work, and you grew and, and learned so much. When I was at that early stage startup, I learned an incredible amount of just how products are built. Um, and I think you can get abstracted away from that when you're at a larger company um, because you do get maybe more isolated on, say, your product line. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, if you're curious about it, go for it. You're not going to regret it, although you are going to need to maybe speak to why you wanted to go uh, in your future interviews. It doesn't mean you can't go work at a big company ever again. 
Uh, it just means that it's a it's a point in your career that you're going to have to just uh, define uh, as your personal brand. And if it does fail, it's just a bullet point in the story, uh, and it doesn't really reflect on you because again, you're not the one um, responsible for that failure purely. Yeah, definitely. So we have a question、uh, from Will in the、um, comments section. So hi, Will. By the way, thank you for uh, watching. Um, so. How do you bounce back? <laughs> Even if, like, sometimes if you do everything right, it's just not the right timing. Like, for example, COVID, nobody can foresee that. So,、um, so how do you bounce back? How do you feel about this? Yeah, I mean, if the company still goes under, like you're describing here, Will, there's again, like, if、uh, <laughs> it's it's not on you.、Uh, you did everything you could. Um, you can take the learnings that you have,、um, frame them in a case study. Talk about how you tried to save the company. Talk about how you tried to increase, you know, weekly active users, monthly active users, or increase top line revenue.、Um, all those case studies can be applied to any company that you talk to down the line.、Um, don't let it affect your psyche.、Uh, you got to bounce back. You got to be able to jump back into the game and、uh, an interview with confidence because you did good work there. Uh, and that's the thing I think、uh, you need to you need to realize is that、um, if you tried your if you're tr trying your hardest, you're gonna have you're gonna have the work to show for it, and、uh, you can you can take those experiences to your next company. Yeah, I think I want to add a little, which is the what learning、uh, learnings you get out of the experience. I think just be very objective, like you can. Talk about what you did right, which is everything, and what you did wrong, which is、yeah. the、uh, maybe the timing for your product. And there's like, I I feel like in addition to the timing or like the uncontrollable, there is something、um, that maybe you did wrong. So be very honest about that.、And、I think people、uh, appreciate that type of uh, uh, learnings and vulnerability as well. Yeah, for sure. When You know, I was a hiring manager. I've been at twice at two different companies, both at Expedia and this last company I was at, H1.、Um, I've hired, you know, dozen plus people at this point in my career, and everyone that I've hired has just been honest.、Um, that's one thing that I look for, and I think a lot of hiring managers look for is someone who's honest, who's willing to be vulnerable and humble about the experience, and say, "Hey, you know, I made a decision." It was the wrong decision.、Uh, this test failed, or this product didn't do what it was supposed to do.、Uh, we learned from it. We iterated. Here's where we got to. Like any general case study, throwing uh, learnings um, uh, in that case study is key. So just like what you were saying, Ryan, I think you you got to include learnings,、um, and and you will have those even if the company、uh, totally bombs out. Yeah, and don't try to like hide it.、Um, I once interviewed a, a candidate, so I, I don't interview a lot of people with failed startup experience. But then I insert failure questions to just see how the person、uh, one reflect on their, themselves and how humble they are, or are they willing to learn and take feedback? And the person they just like they did the the spin. On a like spin thing. So the question was something about like how you like tell me a time when you failed or like you had difficulty working with other people cross functionally. And they were like, "Oh, I am too organized and I work too fast." But that that's like、ah, not not a good thing. So we and we didn't end up hiring the person, and not just because this question, but this question like like. Because I didn't really feel a real connection and reflection there,、uh, it definitely did not add to、uh, their case. So I think、uh, the industry still values like、uh, the humility and the growth mindset. Yeah, for、yeah. sure. All right, thank you, Will, again for your question. And we have another question in the comment from Neve. I hope you I pronounce your name right. So, do you have any tips for getting more self serve or at least access to data and advocating for getting more touch with data, user research, and etc.?、Um, she also said,、uh, 
uh, for uh, context, she has said a startup with two data analysts and four designers um, don't have any self-serve dashboard like you mentioned uh, earlier. Yeah, it's a great question. And sometimes it can be a predicament for sure to jump in to an organization that has yet to create, say, a dashboard or, or even the self-service tooling, right? I would say look for your advocates within the company and look for your, your folks who you can partner with who maybe have access to the data that you're hoping to get to and really start to build a bridge there. Um, see if there's a way that you can, you know, build the political boundaries uh, or, or not boundaries, but overcome the boundaries that maybe have, have formed over time uh, within the organization and just ask the questions. And maybe the organization is small enough that you can uh, talk to folks uh, at the senior level who can make it happen, right? And really make the case for it. Um, I guarantee the company would want this. Uh, it's just a matter of prioritization. And so if, uh, if they're hearing it from you, that just adds another voice to the prioritization, right? Every company wants to empower their users or in, their internal employees. Um, I would say make the case of it. And, you know, Rand, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you say. You know, you've worked at obviously some uh, awesome um, analytics tools out there. So you probably have a take here too. Um, wow, I, I've been brainwashed. So one thing I think you can do, Neve, is um, go to your data analyst. Um, if like, so one thing that I learned at Amplitude is data scientists don't actually hate self-serve tools. Um, so they have a little bit of concerns, but they actually love Amplitude or tools like Amplitude, like Mixpanel or Heap uh, for people to uh, answer their own stupid product questions or design questions that they don't really uh, enjoy pulling data for. So if you can com like convince them there's a lot of value in having some sort of self-serve tool so we can answer our own question. So we don't bother you so much and you can um, use all the free time that you get from not answering these product questions to do like your data, like the, the dream projects for data scientists, like modeling and like predictive things, whatever data scientists do. And I, I clearly I'm not one. So I do think that's a great value prop. And uh, they can kind of act like the data governor persona where they will be in charge of like the cleanness and the rightness of the data. And then you can always like go get a, a second opinion when you're making like important product decisions. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is they want to empower you. They also want it to be right. Uh, and that's why there's trepidation. <laughs> and so you you know, that second opinion piece that you mentioned there, Ran, is, is, is key. Like if you are going to be self, if you're, if there is going to be self-service and empowered um, across the team to pull your own data, there has to be some governance involved and you need to be able to check in and find, because it's too easy to pull data that's, that's wrong. Uh, you know, you have some field or some sort of, you know, filters, that's that's incorrect and yet it confirms maybe a bias <laughs> that you're hoping for and then you just take the data and run with it so when i was at expedia we always had some data go we had data governance and some gates around uh, some of the self-service tooling that we had there too yeah same so like when you're mi uh, making mission critical decisions like on um, prioritizations even you should definitely consult data team but like i in my personal experience like for designers sometimes we just want data that's really small like how many people click on this button and what do they do next yeah. or like those are tiny decisions that even if you get like not perfect data i think it's still not going to affect your business in the long run but it's extremely yeah. useful for you as a designer because you want to know how people interact with certain things you designed uh, in your product and if you just that's like very low uh, consequence, but like really high frequency questions. Like if you go to your data team every time, they're gonna be so overwhelmed yeah. and you feel bad to like talk to them every time you have a small question. So that's probably something that can definitely be uh, uh, made self-serve. 
Yeah, I love that. And that's, it actually speaks to kind of the, maybe a little bit difference of the large scale versus small scale company is you're going to be able to have a little bit more of that squishy room in a smaller stage company, because at the end of the day, maybe it doesn't have as big of an impact as say, pushing out a, a change to millions of users uh, at a fang company or something like that. Cool. Awesome. Well, do we have more questions in the audience? Seems like that's all of it. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for coming. And it's uh, uh, so, um, I feel so enlightened. <laughs> Again, every time <laughs> I talk to you, and I, I wish I talked to you way earlier in my careers and really think about like the stage versus industry. Um, it's very mm. helpful to get your perspective. Yeah, so you bet. Before, I, yeah, go oh, ahead. I was just going to say one, one other thing to consider. And I think this is key because it affects, uh, it, it plays a part of this community. If you are going to go to a smaller stage company, I would just say my last recommendation is to lean on this community because you're not going to have the career support necessarily at a smaller stage company as you would in a larger scale company. You're not going to have coaching leadership that's like very hyper-focused on say growth. You're going to have more general direction. Uh, you will be able to step up into leadership opportunities at a smaller org. Um, and when you do that, you may find yourself saying like, I don't know what I'm doing or, you know, I've been given all this autonomy and independence, but I don't actually know exactly what to do next or, or how to grow. And so I'll just put a plug in for the Slack group and for the, the online community here with growthdesigners.co, um, lean into this community, ask the questions, jump in, uh, engage with others and really have dialogue, if, especially if, if you're at a, um, an earlier stage company, because it's going to be harder to get the answers that you really want. I mean, there's a lot of resources out there for sure, but there's nothing better than just hopping on a call or, or maybe uh, joining one of the community conversations that we have or just asynchronous uh, Slack messages too. Oh, we got, we got one last question. So I hope you have a few more minutes, Scott. For... I do, I do, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what are specific things I should be focused on learning now that I have decided I'm interested in growth design? That's a great question. Um, you know, as a growth designer, um, like I mentioned earlier, I think understanding the business is key. Understanding business strategy, really knowing how does your company make money uh, and why, <laughs> how does the product play a part of that? Because as a growth designer, you are there to grow the business, whether that be users. And if you are growing users, that is essentially to grow monetization down the line. Um, and so how do you make money? And, and just understanding how you play in the competitive marketplace um, really goes a long ways. So auditing other competitors out there, understanding what they're doing from maybe a growth tactic and uh, you know, how can you mirror or exceed what, what's happening out there in, in the marketplace. Um, yeah, I would just say start, start with understanding the company uh, and, and truly being able to speak to the business strategy. It's going to make you much more relevant in conversations that you have with product managers, with you know, cross-functional teams. Um, just understanding that and how that uh, trickles into your data, into the data and having that self-serve or, or just having access to that data will help you to be um, very proactive, answer questions, because you as a de designer are asking a lot of questions. You're an inquisitive person, otherwise you wouldn't be a designer. And uh, you know, these are the things I think from a baseline perspective uh, that you can really start to make a huge impact. I I'd love to hear what you have to say, Rand. You have a lot of experience here too. Yeah, I think it's also like, I wanna echo on the connection between user, user value and business value. That's a lot of designers don't like what they don't do. I remember um, Lex wrote an article a long time ago. Like I still remember the banner, which is like a bunch of C's and then there's one that's uh, grayed out. So it's like why designers don't get a seat at the table. I, I know that as designers, I hear a lot that designers complain about, look, I don't, I don't get an uh, invite to this crucial meetings. But then on the other hand, they just keep going on and on on some visual details. And then 
like not really thinking about design scope as a um, a strategic piece to uh, grow your business, but just doing like a pet project. I just want a perfect design, and oh, let's work on this like easing function, for example, for an afternoon, so that we delight user. So I think the business acumen of designers is lacking, and if you can, you can focus on that piece that make. That that make sure your design will always add the maximum amount of value. Like your design should really change based on your company's strategy. I remember when I joined first joined Amplitude, Amplitude was still kind of looking for like product market fit a little bit. So we were the cheaper version of mix panel. Haha. <laughs>、uh, now I think it's reverse a little bit. Sorry, friend. But anyways, so like we were just building like. New and like powerful and powerful features because we we want to be like the more powerful tool out there. And I did have so many charts that nobody uses, like engagement matrix. Like you should check it out.、Um, so like those are the early strategy. But once、um, the company starts to shift strategy to target more enterprise teams, like IBM or like the Fortune 500 companies. Like our design strategy change, we start building like features that that's less focus on depth but more breadth. Like we're working on getting more users、uh, to just doing like smaller things. So we build like、uh, your spaces where you get to like your teammates' things, and we're working on features like that instead of like continue adding more power. So like. Business strategy will have like direct impact into your design. So if you can just like figure out the connection, I think that's that's a really really important thing. Yeah, I would add one other thing to that. I think one thing to consider is also just the industry and the the context that you play in. It's kind of like fish. I, I feel like earlier in my career,、um, I didn't I didn't understand the nuances between B to C, B to B. Product-led growth, things like that. It's like a fish not knowing they're in water. It really affects everything、um, because it is, again, it is the company strategy, and it will directly affect the design strategy. So, in fact, I'll just share my screen once again.、Um, I wanted to just share a matrix that I put together.、Um, I believe this will show here now, but、uh, this is something that is in the newsletter. Um, that I published just earlier this month, but when thinking about growth startup,、uh, like your target zone, quote unquote, you're going to be hard pressed to do true growth if you're in B two B SaaS that's not product led. Okay, this is your traditional sales led approach that has a giant sales force that goes out and sells the product. Right, the product is not selling itself. So, people are, and that's the traditional way that it's been done for a long time. If you are in a product-led B two B SaaS product, that's going to allow you to, of course, employ a lot of growth tactics.、Uh, and B two C is the creme de la creme. It's always been、uh, growth oriented because they have to be,、um, because it is very much, you know, B two C is just it is difficult, and those companies that make it huge, it like. So much respect, because B two C is very hard. B two B SaaS is always easier from the ex- and easier is relative term. No startup is easy, but when it comes to、um, getting something up and out the door,、um, I think you always start with like、uh, a cold start problem with B two C. Whereas B two B SaaS、um, with a product led growth is a little bit more easy from a go to market sales motion. So that's what you see there on the X axis. On the Y axis. Again, the maturity stage. We talked about it earlier.、Um, you know, from my experience in seed and Series A companies, yeah, it's a little bit more squishy. It's hard to really get into the kind of that true、uh, growth experience, as well as late in public.、Um, you know, that that's going to be a, a vastly different experience that we've we've already alluded to. But Series B through Series D, those are companies that are going through hyper growth. Um, they call it the growth stage for a reason, and that's where you're going to see a lot of、um, kind of overlap there. So, I know that was kind of a lot here at the tail end, 
Uh, but Rand, just building on, on your comment there, I feel like knowing, especially that go-to-market sales motion that your company is employing is going to be huge to understand what your environment is um, and product-led growth as well as B2C is really kind of the money, uh, the money areas there you want to, that you want to be in as a growth designer. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, that was my um, my last question is going to be, do you have any last words? So you <laughs> answered your own question without me even asking. So two more questions for you. Where can people find you on the internet and how can we add value to you? Uh, yeah, great question. So I can be found um, on LinkedIn, just Scott Christensen. Um, I am doing my own advising right now. Uh, so I'm a growth design advisor. I have a couple clients um, right now, always looking for more. So ways that you can help me if there's a startup that you're a part of that wants to you know, refine their onboarding or acquisition strategy, let me know. I also work, of course, in, in, engage, in the engagement space as well as monetization. Um, happy to consult as well as team up and partner with you. Other ways uh, that you can help out, I guess uh, I do advising as well. If you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, I definitely do that, um, as well as fractional leadership for growth design teams at earlier stage companies. Yeah, do you have um, any industry or sizes or series um, specification for the companies that you, you work primarily with? Yeah, primarily early, earlier on the, on the spectrum. So just due to my experience, uh, anything from, you know, Series A to Series C. Uh, and then it, when it comes to the, the go-to-market sales motion, definitely B2C um, or product-led growth within the B2B SaaS realm. Um, I also work with a couple companies. I've worked with a couple companies that are transitioning from traditional B2B SaaS to a product-led growth motion or even product-led sales. So that's a new kind of buzzword that's happening out there right now. Um, but product-led sales is something that I'm, I'm really fascinated about as well. And I've consulted a company on that as, um, recently and uh, would happy, be happy to talk to traditional B2B SaaS companies who are thinking about product-led sales or transitioning fully to a product-led growth um, or employing product-led growth uh, sales motion as one of their tactics. Yeah, sounds like next time uh, you come back to the channel, we'll be talking about <laughs> what the H is, <laughs> is product-led sales. Yes, that is a whole nother ball game. But if you want to look uh, at product-led sales, there's some cool companies out there. Uh, Pocus, as well as um, uh, Endgame and a few others. Awesome. But essentially, they're just in, they're using product analytics to empower their sales team to have warm leads rather than cold outreach great that's great so come back <laughs> come back soon <laughs> to learn more about product led sales well yep. um again scott thank you so much for your time today i surely learned a lot and i hope everyone who is watching feels the same um and uh we'll have to talk talk again soon yeah for sure thanks for having me on ran appreciate it yeah All right bye Thank you, everyone. See you next time.